Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. Our skin, you know, it's not only the biggest organ of our body, it's also the most visible. So when something changes or doesn't look quite right, we notice, or somebody else does. <laughs> <laughs> Problems of the skin, the hair, and the nails can range from acne and hair loss to something more serious like skin cancer. You know about dermatologists? I Tell do. Tell us how many different conditions they see. <laughs> well, dermatologists, in fact, diagnose and treat more than 3,000 different conditions. Hard to believe. Here to discuss some of those skin and hair problems is Mayo Clinic dermatologist, actually my favorite dermatologist, Dr. Don Davis. Welcome back to the program. Well, thank you, Tom and Tracy. <laughs> it's my pleasure to be here. Don't tell Dr. Brewer that I said that. I'm <laughs> not telling anyone, Okay, <laughs> but it's a feather in my cap for the day. Okay, good. You know, it is interesting that it, the skin uh, is our largest organ, but it's, a, it's a, sort of hard to think about it as an organ as compared to the liver or the spleen or the uh, lungs. But it, it is more than just a wrapper or a coating, isn't it? It is, absolutely. The skin is the largest organ. And I thought you were going to say the most important organ, but it is definitely my favorite <laughs> well, organ. the bones. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. I forgot. But you literally can't live without your skin. If you didn't have your skin for a few minutes, you wouldn't be here. So the skin is very important. And it, it's a large surface area, which is how it gets to be the largest organ. If you stretched out the skin, it would be the size of an NFL football field. What? So that's a very large amount of space and a lot of chemistry and science and metabolism going on all the time. The skin is multiple layers thick and it grows and sheds in 28 to 30 day cycles. So you get a brand new you, if you will, about once a month. Do you, uh, I'm just going to pretend that I'm a der dermatologist for a second. And the way that skin changes the most over your lifetime is just getting drier is that true? Is there other ways that the skin changes? There are other ways that the skin changes with our immunity and with hormone regulation as we age. Mm. So with puberty onset and then sciescence mm. of hormones when we reach menopause or for men, menopause. <laughs> <laughs> and then also uh, just biological aging with sun damage and things like that. Exposure to the environment like wind and chemicals over time. And then last but not least, changes of the immune system. So as our immune system learns and grows more robust through childhood and then through midlife as it stays hopefully very stable and you don't develop autoimmunity. And then as you age and it becomes a little bit more forgetful or senescent. And so those factors are really what determine what happens with our skin over time. Is it true that most of the dust and detritus that we find in our homes is caused by dead skin? Yes. So when we all dust our homes and have those <laughs> chores, that most of the components of dust that you see on your furniture is simply dead skin cells because we actively shed them all the time, 24-7. It's the only continually growing and regenerating organ. So when you get so that swiffer out, it's skin. That's oh, dead skin you're I picking up. I did not need to know that. <laughs> but you get a brand new you every month. <laughs> oh, good. Well, one of the things that we wanted to do is talk about some of the problems that people can have with their skin, skin issues, and hair loss. But let's first start out talking about acne, because uh, people will say that's a kid's problem, but unfortunately... It's not just a, ch a kid's problem. Yeah, so acne can actually happen across the entire lifespan, and it just happens in different forms for different reasons. So you can actually get acne as a neonate, which is technically defined as the first 28 days of life, and that can be due to circulating hormones from the mom coming across the placenta and then causing inflammation in the child to lead to acne. Then you can get infantile acne, which is where the infant's own immune system and cortisol stress levels of the adrenal glands flux and cause acne vulgaris, if you will. However, it's in an infant and young child. And then the acne we all think of is truly acne vulgaris, which is when with the onset of puberty, our oil glands become stimulated by hormones and also with the fluctuation of hormones um, through cycling, for example, for women or growth spurts for boys. The cortisol from our adrenal glands rises and spikes with stress, whether that be pubertal stress or teenage stress, and then hormones fluctuate through puberty as well. And those stress releases cause oil production, which then overgrows bacteria. And if your skin is sticky and plugged, you'll get acne. And then as we reach middle age, especially for females, we can have... Um, adult onset acne, also oh. known as middle age female acne, but no Worst. lady likes to hear that. <laughs> and so that's driven by hormone dysregulation in, in the woman, which causes stress to the body and then releases acne. 
usually you, along the jawline and the mm-hmm. chin. And then as we get older, um, in our senior years with sun damage and time, the skin simply doesn't slough as well. And so it can make large blackheads, which are called open comedones. And that's not necessarily due to internal factors, but they cause an acne-like eruption of blackheads that's, ca- that's called Fav Rocochot. Say that again. Fav Rocochot. That sounds like that's French. We. <laughs> <laughs> Best served with fish. And I, I want I want you to talk to us <laughs> about the treatment of acne. But yes. let me may I first tell you how I was treated for acne? Absolutely. So uh, I had a problem when I was a teenager. Uh, my brother didn't for whatever reason, and so we had a family practitioner in Newton, Iowa, a lovely woman, Dr. Dorothy Forsyth, and she this was sort of her specialty. And you would go in once a week, and she would take a pipette or the end of an eyedropper, and she would pop all of your zits. And then she would take a little electrocautery and kill, presumably kill the cell with an electric charge. So you wouldn't, you'd never get a pimple than that one again. And then they would put on this stuff called Iowa Formula, and it was sort of like tan turpentine. Um, and And none of it worked very well. But you know how I got to do it, because... She would break the skin. She would draw a little blood sometimes when she would use the pipette. So it was called surgery. So Blue Cross and Blue Shield paid for it. And that's where my parents let me do it. Wow. But it didn't work very well. You're better than that. Have you now. ever heard of that? I, I hope so. Yes. I've heard of very interesting treatments in the in, in the in days Iowa. before of us. Ancient. And in rural <laughs> From areas. Iowa. Yes. So in, in before we had better treatment for acne, people used to get pipette extraction or just extraction um, in all sorts of various forms like Tom has had. They also would get cryotherapy to their skin. So people would simply freeze the pimples to cause all the inflammation to die. Or they would actually put radiation on the skin and people would get x-ray therapy and Grenz ray therapy for acne because if you necrose the skin, it can't make acne because it can't So you kill the skin with the radiation. Correct. I mean, if you kill the inflammatory cells, (laughs) then you can't get acne. But unfortunately, that leads to poor downstream consequences. Like thyroid cancer? Yeah, like radiation, dermatitis, cancers of all sorts. It suppresses your immune system. So we have many more advanced ways that are better and safer to treat acne now, many of which are over-the-counter. Such as? So over-the-counter things you can do include benzoyl peroxide and salicylic acid. This helps unstick the skin, if you will, decrease inflammation in the superficial layers of the skin, and it also helps control the number of natural uh, bacteria that are supposed to be on the skin called propionum bacterium acnes. It keeps their numbers under control. If over-the-counter stuff doesn't work? Yes. So let me back up a moment and say that anyone with mild to moderate or severe acne, the first thing they should do is start washing their skin twice a day with soap and water because a lot of people take for granted that they don't need to do that very often, much less twice a day. And it's well known in dermatology, and there's been some studies performed on this that show that twice a day face washing with a mild soap actually helps clear acne. And we think that that's simply because it helps remove dirt, dander, and superficial oil, and it might slightly unplug the skin. So the first thing you can do for acne that's over the counter is wash your face twice a day with soap and water. And based on the fact that adolescents are the most likely people to get acne, that's the last thing they want to do because they'd rather talk to their friends or be on social media. But (laughs) true, right? True. So or for people who are adults, they have work and they have their, you know, their home life and things like that. They have other things to do. But it actually doesn't take, as, it's just as long as brushing your teeth. Hopefully most people brush their teeth twice a day. And so while they're in this, at the sink brushing their teeth, they can wash their face. But if you apply over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide and salicylic acid and you don't get any improvement from that or you don't get enough improvement to your liking, then you can see a primary care doctor or dermatologist for advanced prescriptions. And those include topical prescription acids that help exfoliate the skin, control inflammation and control bacteria numbers, and then topical antibiotics that helpful that also help with inflammation and controlling bacteria. Advanced treatments include hormone regulation pills for females. There's certain blood pressure pills that can be used in women that we also believe help control the stress response and hormone levels. And then last but not least, we have isotretinoin, which is a systemic variant of a derivative of vitamin A that's only available by prescription that helps permanently shrink oil glands and it helps exfoliate your skin rapidly. So that way when you have increased turnover and decreased oil, it helps with severe acne. 
there was a study recently that said those with acne are more likely to suffer from depression. And you were saying for teens, you know, that when you're stressed or for adults too, you know, it shows on your face right. with breakouts. Is there a link? Do you find that with your patients? Yes. I find that most skin diseases are linked to a lot of psychosocial um, concern simply because the skin is the organ that everyone can see. And we put so much emphasis in society on appearance and vanity. So I think it's sort of a positive feedback loop, if you will. If you have bad acne, you probably don't feel so good about yourself and it makes you feel have a lesser, more depressed mood. If you're depressed, you feel kind of um, lethargic and so you're less likely to be motivated to do things and it's hard to get up and get motivated to wash your face or put on medicine. And so then it just is a positive feedback cycle. I, we do see with patients that we've studied with um, intensive acne treatment and we do quality of life assessments for them their quality of life improves significantly once their skin starts to clear they simply look better and feel better about themselves all right dr don davis time for a short break you know we haven't gotten very far on that list of three thousand different skin <laughs> conditions that dr davis knows something about uh, but when we come back we'll switch gears and talk about some other conditions plus we've got a myth or matter of fact Myth or matter of fact, age spots, also known as liver spots, may be a signal of liver problems. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are with skin specialist, dermatologist, Dr. Don Davis. We've talked about acne. We beat that to death, haven't we? But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at least we got some answers. You so know, much acne, uh, yeah. so little time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, oh, one last question. Chocolate have anything to do with it? Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. If you knew how much chocolate I ate, you would know that it cannot cause acne. <laughs> <laughs> Myth or matter of fact, age spots or liver spots may be a signal of liver problems. Myth or fact? Uh, pretty much myth. So liver spots, age spots, my patients don't like those terms, so I say wisdom spots. Mm -hmm. So wisdom spots are simply due to the color cells of the skin dysregulating their release of pigment because they're getting a little old, forgetful, and damaged from sun and time. And so um, we usually don't grow new moles or freckles after the age of around 25 unless we're in, preg in pregnancy. But for the rest of us, as time goes on, most of us will have skin-related um, freckling or spotting, if you will, from age 25 onward simply due to time and sun exposure. And so photo protection um, helps prevent that. And then your that genetics. That would be like sunscreen? Sunscreen, clothing, yeah. hats, yeah. sunglasses. All right, so it doesn't have anything to do with the liver? Not really, no. Let's talk about hair loss. Do men and women both lose their hair for the same reason? Well, men and women both lose their hair commonly. It's more socially acceptable in men. And yes, they both lose their hair due to testosterone receptors on the scalp, but they lose their hair in different patterns. Okay. Um, testosterone receptors. So women have testosterone? Yes. So all women and men both have estrogen and testosterone. It's just that men have more testosterone than estrogen and women have more estrogen than testosterone. But our hair has various testosterone receptors in the follicle unit that help it grow. And so if you are genetically predisposed to have particular types of testosterone receptors on your scalp, then um, with hormone stimulation of a puberty in adulthood, if you have an excess or those receptors are simply um, finely attuned and overzealous, it will cause your hair density or the hair shaft itself to decrease in diameter. And so your hair will become miniaturized and also the hair follicle will retract upward in the skin. So the hair is not deeply seated and it's not thick. It's more thin and it's superficial. And over time that leads to miniaturization of follicles which then leads to what we call male pattern baldness and female pattern baldness. Okay, well, there you go. That's why it happens. Hey, what can, what can yeah. you do about yeah. it? Yeah. Yes. Stop it. So for women, what happens is you'll notice a widening of the central part or a thinning of the crown of the scalp, and then it slowly goes out at like a ring from there, and they'll become thin or bald on the top of the crown, but they'll maintain their frontal hairline and the sides and back. For men, they'll get the classic bald spot in the back of the crown. They'll get temporal recession, and then that will blend together, and they can actually lose all their hair. So if you start seeing hair loss, the best time to intervene is immediately because you want to halt that hormone stimulation and progression on the scalp. 
over-the-counter Rogaine works very well. Uh, you can use it once or twice a day, and pretty much everyone can use maximum strength. You don't need to start off with the average strength Rogaine. We want um, full strength. Full, full strength, yeah. maximum strength, once or twice a day. Uh, keep using it, maintain it, because it blocks those receptors, and then seek help from a dermatologist who can talk about advanced therapies for you. All right, one last quick question about hair. Why does it turn gray? It turns gray simply because the color cells in the bulb that give it pigment, they grow senescent with age. And then when the pigment's no longer there, the protein shaft reflects white light. Oh, ran or, out of pigment. Or because of your kids. <laughs> uh, let's talk about facial peels. Because if I've got a dermatologist here, I want to talk about facial peels. Which ones should I use and which ones should I not use? Yes. So there are multiple um, products or chemicals that people will put on the skin in form of a peel. And the goal of the peel is simply to exfoliate the skin, meaning taking off the rough layers, and also to uh, cleanse or hydrate the skin based on what's involved. So people feel refreshed after a facial, if you will, simply because you've chemically denuded the dead layer on top of you. Denuded? Which yes, denuded. <laughs> You've kind of um, broken down acidically the dead skin on top, which allows your real surface, because the cap or crust is gone, to shine through. And then sometimes they can be hydrating or moisturizing. And so you can do some over-the-counter face masks that do that. And then you can go in for um, prescription strength amounts that have acids or vitamin C. Ask her about cellulite, because it only happens in women, right? <laughs> There's nothing you can do about cellulite, is there? Well, cellulite happens as we age simply because the tentacles of the skin, if you will, that anchor the skin to the um, fascia and muscle below tend to break down with time, and things can kind of herniate through. Uh, maintaining a healthy weight helps a lot, because the more stress burden there are on the tentacles, the more it is likely to break down. So people start to notice that around middle age. But if you control your weight, um, that that will help a lot. Some people are just more pre genetically predisposed than others. But cosmetic dermatologists and plastic surgeons oftentimes have ways that they can help remove the cellulite. A 60-second PSA for sunscreen because it is spring break time yes. and moving into summer. Well, thank you for allowing me to speak on sunscreen because it really is a big deal. So photoprotection is the only thing you can do to reduce your risk of skin cancer because you can't control time, you don't want to make the sun go away, and you can't control your genetics. And so using photoprotection has been shown to, to definitely decrease your risk of all forms of skin cancer, and it also decreases your risk of photoaging, which is nice. So for everyday wear, SPF 15, for limited outdoor use, SPF 30, and for days on the beach, SPF 50. And don't forget about sunscreen impregnated clothes that are listed UPF factor 15, 30, 50, et cetera, plus hats and sunglasses. It's interesting. I think you've told us before that you use sunscreen year round, even though you live in Minnesota. I'm wearing sunscreen right now, oh. SPF 30. Yeah. I tell you what, she, her skin does look great, doesn't it? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I have to practice what it's, I preach. It's Absolutely. working, and you probably don't go to the tanning beds either. I definitely avoid the tanning beds. If you want to look more beige or brown than you are, there's no sin in that. But you can do that in a healthy way with self-tanner because self-tanner um, has temporary dye in it that sticks to the dead layers of skin on top and will last seven to ten days they're getting much easier to apply they don't necessarily over stick to a uh, roughened skin and make you look orange or um, an, a shade of brown you don't like they will last seven to ten days and they come in multiple shades that are more palatable to natural skin tone than it did back in the 70s and 80s where there was one shade of orange orange you just spray it on you, there's lots of ways. Uh, yeah, okay. Creams, <laughs> sprays. You can even go to a spa and have it sprayed on by a professional. So if you want to pamper yourself, and that's why you go to the tanning bed, pamper yourself instead with a scrub and a spray. Uh, yeah. You have a birthday coming up? Yep. To get you some of that. <laughs> I don't get care a if I look brown. Job. <laughs> uh, healthy skin is not brown. <laughs> Dr. Don Davis, dermatologist, Mayo Clinic. Thanks so much. Always great to have you on the program. My pleasure. Thanks for including me.